Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's officially October, which means the regular season start is right around the corner. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, I figured we should start today by just uh, mentioning the passing of Calgary Flames assistant general manager Chris Snow. Yeah, it's one of those uh, situations where anybody who understands ALS knew that this was going to be the outcome a lot sooner than, you know, he was only 42 and it's just a horrible, horrendous disease. And, you know, with Chris, uh, Chris the, was kept alive long enough that they could uh, donate his organs, which I think is a great thing that he's able to help people in death as well as he did in life. Cause there's so many people have said that Chris helped, you know, help them out or touch their lives in some way. Yeah, and truly fitting for a person like Chris and, you know, all of the funds that they were able to raise for ALS research helped both him and other people with ALS uh, and will continue to do so moving forward. Like his type of ALS, it was more of like a one year timeline and he ended up living for four years after his diagnosis, so... Uh, that part is a true blessing, and it's just unfortunate that he was struck in with such a horrendously bad disease. And you know what? I think this is one of those times when we can really look at the Calgary Flames organization and just be thankful for everything that they do. Like, you know, we're not going to probably see it, but you know that Kelsey Snow, his wife, and his children are going to be taken care of. The Flames are going to make sure that probably that contract is honored, and if there's anything they need, they'll take care of it. I would not be surprised if all the funeral costs were borne by the organization. Like we hear so often about the great things the Calgary Flames do and how they treat people. And I know there's been a lot of talk recently of people wanting out of town and, you know, maybe not having a nice arena, but I think it's these kind of things when it makes me reflect on, you know, the Calgary Flames and how they treat people. Yeah. And if you're a good person and you treat people the right way, you know, it just breeds that type of community. And the Flames and Chris Snow have uh, been exemplary in their delivery of who they are as people. And, you know, they did not hide anything of, you know, like... Um, well, not even hiding, but so many people would would ask for privacy to deal with a yeah. disease like this, you know, or an, or an ailment like this in private with their family and Chris and Kelsey and the kids have been out front and you know I think probably showing people that you know I'm battling with this here's what this is like and you know if I can do it you can do it and I think that's awesome that Chris has been so public with his ALS yes I agree uh, a true Calgary Flames zero and you know if there's ever uh, been a reason for the Forever Aflame program. It's this is for it. a situation exactly like this. Yep. Uh, because he he deserves to have his name in the rafters for, for sure. yeah, being you, a, a truly inspirational force. And, you know, I mean, we've seen the Flames do things like the Media Lounge. It's called the Ed Whalen Media Lounge with the Peter Marr broadcast booth. I would not be surprised if there's something named in this arena or the next after Chris Snow, so it'll always be remembered. But I agree with you with Forever Flame. I think the creator of Forever Flame, Ken King, and then also Chris Snow would both be great inductions there. I agree. Because they both are exemplary examples of what it is to be a Calgary Flame. I agree. And, you know, it, that you, those are the type of people that you always look up to, at, you, you know, because they just do the right things. And it's not contrived or anything. They're just authentically awesome at the things that they do. And... You know, it's just it amazed me how many people in the league came out and talked about Chris and how they t how he touched their lives and people that didn't even play for the Flames. Like it seems like he just has a positive impact everywhere he goes. Yeah, and even uh, Eddie Vedder uh, paid tribute to him as well. And you know, it, it's one of those things where you know, it, it, how would you say it? in this world, it you know, for people to do something genuinely good. It stands out as, you know, something different <laughs> than the, the typical. And, you know, um, 
it it's just a horrendous situation and the grace that uh, Kelsey and the the kids and Chris have throughout this whole situation is just truly remarkable it sure is well let's move on to maybe a I guess a lighter note maybe not depends on how you look at this past week but the Flames played four uh, exhibition games on Monday night there was a split squad game half of the group was in Calgary half of them were in Seattle and Seattle had of course half there and half here Um, this is a weird thing to say but the Calgary Flames both won and lost the Seattle Kraken in the same night yep so uh, the the game that was played in Calgary was a 5-3 loss, and the game that was played in Seattle, a 3-2 shootout win. Matt, do, I don't think we need to go through each one of these, um, but two things I noticed in the home one, Uyghur got 24 minutes of penalty time. Like, when's the last time a guy got that much penalty time? Well, when the referee kind of ticks you off and you want to let him know exactly what you think of him, the preseason's the time to do that, <laughs> so that way you're not really harming the team. But but at the same time, it's like the preseason, not the time to do that. Just shut your mouth, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's a- as what, as the pro wrestler The Rock would say, know your role and shut your mouth. Yeah, well, and after the game, Michael Backlund had a talking with Uyghur about that whole incident. And, well, how would you say, though, the refereeing in the game was quite poor uh throughout and um overly calling penalties just for no apparent reason at times really and you know it 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 is one of those things that like referees are in uh, preseason form too and that will change as the start of the season comes but you know the whole team just seemed kind of flat at times and the defense score was uh rather poor in this game and then you know i thought in that home game it was really hard for the flames to get into any sort of rhythm when there was so much special teams play like it seemed every couple minutes there was some sort of a a penalty or something like that i mean if you you know if you look at the the time on it there was they were always either power play you know, PK. And I think it was hard to get your lines rolling and get the things you wanted out of the preseason in those cases. Yeah. And especially because the flames are primarily are a five on five team from last year. Uh, and you know, like they get on a roll when their things are just even up and you know, like, and when it's constantly, you know, somebody in the penalty box, regardless of which team, it just throws your rhythm off. And, you know, it, it's one of those where it's preseason and, you know, it, you kind of have to just shrug it off and go, well, at least, uh, you know, they've been able to score goals consistently throughout the preseason and, that, anything, that, that's about it you know anything you want to say about the other game the one in seattle i, I just thought it was more of a hard working effort uh, overall um players that are actually pushing for nhl roster spots uh i thought Ilya Sol- Solyolyev, uh soloviev there we go there you go you uh, finally said it right yeah we got some tweets about that last week yeah soloviev there you go uh, he, uh, looked really well in that game and, uh, yeah, and he's looking like he's pushing for an NHL roster spot. And even in the games following, he's been excellent. And you know, that's usually the case in the split squad. Usually the flames have the more veteran roster at home and they have a more, let's call it tryout or AHL roster on the road. And I mean, we see that here too. The only guy really of note on that roster was, uh, Igor Sharon Govich. And I think it, do- and I guess Dylan Dubé too, but it does give a chance to really see how some of those young guys look. And I found it interesting to watch that game because of that. You were really seeing, I would say, the better uh, Seattle roster in Seattle playing against the Flames roster. And, you know, I mean, the Seattle roster had a lot of their NHL guys. And for the Flames to win three to two, I think it says something about a lot of those players. I agree. And Vladar played excellently. He did. Um, and then the Calgary Flames played at home on Wednesday, and it was a 3-2 to two, uh, shootout win for the Calgary Flames over the Winnipeg Jets. Any thoughts on this game, Matt? Uh, 
I thought Dustin Wolf was excellent when uh, he had uh, shots actually against them. Uh, Winnipeg had a hard time doing anything against the Flames, really, for the first two periods, only mustering seven shots. Uh, Calgary, I thought, dominated, considering the fact that they had the weaker lineup of the two teams. I agree. And you know, Yeah, Connor- the official shot count here for Winnipeg, three in the first, four in the second, th- ten in the third, and four in overtime. Yeah, like it was not a very good effort by the Winnipeg Jets. And frankly, I thought Wolf was excellent in the shootout and won the game for the Flames. I agree. And, you know, I've said this already in our previous episodes, but I really liked what I saw from Adam Klapka here. I think he's a, he's been a pleasant surprise. He's a guy who came over from Europe, played well in the HL last year. I think there's a guy, I don't think you'll see him on the opening day roster, but I think this is a guy who could be in a first call-up scenario, and you probably will see wearing a flaming C sometime this season. Yeah, and the only uh, way I could see him um, making the opening day lineup is if the Flames are wanting some toughness and like a fighting deterrent possibly up front uh, just to protect some of the other players. That could be, and we'll come back to that thought. I have some more thoughts on that a little later in the show. Mm -hmm. And then on Friday, we saw the first Battle of Alberta for the season. Um, And really, Matt, could there be a more exciting end to a game, especially in the preseason? Like We saw right at the end a a controversial goal. Calgary had already used their challenge. Like The end of the third there, I just thought that it was quite an exciting game to get the Battle of Alberta going. Yeah, and the Michael Backlund play, if that was the regular season, the Flames do not challenge that play. No. Uh, But because it was Backlund's first game wearing the C, that, you know, of course you're going to try and make sure that it counts. And unfortunately, uh, you know, the referees did not agree. That's the downside then, is you don't have the challenge for later. Yeah, and then on top of it, they gave up a power play, and then, of course, the equalizing goal. And then with like zero seconds left on the clock, there was no, t- you know, they, they did actually show a replay and the puck wasn't quite over the line when it hit zero. So it, it the goal would not have counted either way, but, and then of course losing in overtime, but yeah, it's just one of those where, you know, in every way that matters, the Flames won that game, but they didn't win that game. And if it was a regular season, they will probably win that one two nothing with an empty netter. Yeah, and unfortunately they lost uh, two to one. So hopefully that's not a sign of things to come for the Battle of Alberta this year. Yep. And they'll get another crack at the Oilers later this week, which we'll talk about at the end of the show. So I guess probably the big story of the week and where we should go next is the Calgary Flames finally have their captain. Um, something we haven't had for a couple of years. Michael Backlund, officially named captain of the team. And with that announcement came a contract extension for Michael Backlund. So let's talk about the contract first. He's currently making $5.35 million. He got re-signed to a two-year deal at four point five a year. What do you think of that? Perfect. Uh, Makes him a flame toast 36. Yeah, and realistically... The type of player that Michael Backlund is, he will play probably till he's 40. Uh, He's an excellent two-way player, and he makes everybody around him better. Even if the offensive game dries up as he gets 37, 38, 39, the defensive acumen of the player, he will be an NHLer until he doesn't want to be. And this is the type of player that you keep as long as possible, if not their entire career, because anytime you find somebody who can make his line mates better just by him being there, like those guys are worth their weight in gold. And then um, just so you know that it looks like there is a no movement clause again next year, which he has right now, and then a modified no trade clause, 15 team no trade list that begins on January 1st, 2026. That hasn't been reported as much, but wanted to let you guys know that. Matt, would you have gone any longer with this deal? Like, to me, I don't want to go longer than 36 in a guy like this. You can always re-sign him. I mean, look at a guy like Gio who's still playing, re-sign him for a year, but I wouldn't want to tie him up for much longer than that. Yeah, the only way that it would have made sense is if they got the number under four uh, to like add another year uh, or two uh, to the contract. Uh, but 
frankly, uh, with where the Flames are at in terms of their veteran players and because realistically the Flames as a team are kind of in the too good to lose, too lose to, you know, too bad to be a Stanley Cup contender. So, you know, until they figure out what direction they're actually taking, you know, a two-year extension after this year is like the perfect timeline to be able to figure out exactly what this team is moving forward. Yeah, and and I don't think the two years necessarily means he'll be gone after two years, but I wouldn't want to lock him up for much longer than that because you don't know what you're going to get. You don't know what stage he'll be in with his game at that point. Well, Um, and 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 Paul. On top of that, um, he will be 35 when the new contract kicks in, which means that uh, you're like it's harder to buy that contract out. It is, yeah. And I think you know, just like we did for Jerome, I think we need to respect Backlund as well. And if the Flames can't get him the cup that I think he wants in two years, I think we have to let him go chase that. Yeah, and I think that's where the modified no trade clause um, in the final year of the deal makes sense. Because of the fact that, like, if, say, the Flames are not very good two years from now, then, you know, you're going to be having a conversation with Backlund to say, hey, you know, even narrow that 15 teams down to, like, pick your teams more or less, sort of like what Aginla did with Pittsburgh and Boston, and go from there. And, you know, and uh, if the Flames are in that situation, then... You know, I think that it's a good middle ground for uh, both the player and the team. I agree. And you say it all the time when we talk about Backlund and potential trades of him. There's 31 other teams that would love to have this player. So getting him at $4.5 million, I feel like it's probably a hometown discount if he were to go to the open market. I bet there'd be enough of bidding war. He'd probably get around five, probably yeah. similar to his current contract. So I think that also shows something about Michael Backlund. I mean, we heard a lot of these players who didn't want to be here after the summer, who were angry, who were frustrated. And I think this is really, you know, Michael Backlund showing faith in this team, faith in what the Flames can do. And I'm hoping that'll rub off on some of the other guys who need a new deal as well. Yeah, and on top of it, you know, the the team will have a direction from the player group now, which with the last couple seasons not having a captain, I think has caused quite a lot of problems, especially last year, and because they weren't able to unify as a group um, under the captain's wing, and now that the Flames have an actual captain, they can move forward properly. I don't disagree with you there. I think it gives them that leadership. It gives them a veteran guy who they can rally around. And I heard a number of people saying, well, shouldn't Raz or somebody younger be captain? I think what you'll see here is Michael Backlund wearing the C and then two young guys like Rasmus Anderson and somebody else with the A on their chest or one young guy with the A on their chest who becomes the heir apparent. Yeah. And like, I'm sure that like if Backlund had asked for the trade and got the trade, out of Calgary that uh, Anderson probably would have been the captain instead. But uh, you, it's sort of like when Conroy was the captain of the Flames and then passing it on to Aginla. I, I think that that'll basically be the same trajectory that in a couple of years that, you know, whether Backlund stays or goes, you know, that, that will be the thing that will determine when it moves to Anderson. But I think that that's pretty much, you know, set in stone for the time being that that's the trajectory it'll go. And I could even see another veteran ending up with the other A. I, I'm honestly thinking a guy like Nazem Kadri might be a good guy to put the other A on. Yeah, or a guy like Mackenzie Weger, possibly. There are a number of different candidates that are all fairly good. So when I look at this overall as Backlund is the captain and, you know, the Backlund extension, I like this deal for the Flames. You're getting an older guy and you don't want to have too many of them, but you're getting an older guy who is not just seniority, but I think a guy who the players look up to, who in the room is, you know, respected, that sort of thing. And I, I feel like, um, I, I feel like this is a good move all the way around. He's an older guy. There's some stability there having him as the captain 
And he's a guy who, while we haven't seen him decline yet, I mean, usually at that age, you're starting to see sharp declines. You know that he will, but I think there's still another year or two of really good hockey out of him. And then once that really good hockey is over, I think you'll you'll still see him as a valuable sort of veteran piece on this team. Yeah, and much the same way that you saw Giordano over the last few years of his contract. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a good comparison for sure. Um, any? Can you think of any downsides this one? Uh, unless you have something against Michael Backlund or want the team to rebuild like right now, then you'd probably be disappointed because it's like, oh, well, this is getting in the way of the Flames tearing it down. But realistically, the Flames are too good for that scenario anyway. For sure. And I think that, you know, Backland, people don't see it, but he does a lot in the community. And that's something a lot of people don't take into account. But often to be the captain of a major hockey market, you need to not only be the captain on the ice, but off the ice. And I really like Backland and his wife, Frida, for the things they do off the ice to earn that C as well. Yeah, and he's always been a very personable player uh, throughout his career. Uh, even like when you and I first started uh, doing things over at the development camp, like he would always be talking with the fans and whomever else, uh, just because you know, and showed up just because the the young guys were there. And hey, why not? Yeah, he's sort of assumed a, a quiet leadership role on this team. The other major story for this week is uh, Jacob Pelty, a guy who I think we all probably had penciled in for an NHL contract this year, especially with GM Craig Conroy coming out in the offseason and saying we're leaving spots open for young guys. And now it turns out that Pelty has a shoulder injury. He's out what's being listed as indefinitely, which means he's not going to start the season. I'd be surprised with an indefinite injury diagnosis if we see him before Christmas. So as as sad as that is, Matt, I think it also leaves a a spot open. There's a there's a spot now for somebody to take and an opportunity for a young player. Yeah, and with Peltier, his age certainly helps with the recovery time. But yeah, frankly, I'd be shocked if he wasn't, you know, like if it wasn't even like February or March, frankly, with how severe it, the injury seemed, but uh, only time will tell on that. And with that, uh, the Flames do have a number of spots available, and it'll just give room for one of the other good young players like uh, Adam Klapka, who you mentioned earlier, and a whole bunch like Matthew Coronado, who's kind of already expected to make the team. He definitely will. Walker Dewar definitely will. See, and that's where I defer from you. I think a lot of people want Coronado to make the team. I'd start him in the AHL. Like, I think you still got to see what this guy is in Coronado. Yeah, he looks good. Yeah, he's a top prospect. But I'd, I'd start him in the AHL. But I think that with Peltier down, he might get the NHL yeah. nod. Yeah, I was kind of in the, the, you know, not quite sure yet with Coronado as well. Um, and could see that one going either way with Peltier there. But without Peltier... You kind of, it kind of is one of those situations where you have to put Coronado into Peltier's role. Yeah, I mean, we've talked for years about my thoughts on Sam Bennett and how I think that Sam Bennett could have really benefited from some American Hockey League time. And it's hard to jump from U.S. college hockey into the NHL. And really, I mean, as much as we're excited about Coronado, he's played one National Hockey League regular season game. So we still don't know what we've got there. I would put him in the AHL, have him tear up that league, bring him up when you need him, bring him up for a couple looks, but make him the top dog in the AHL. But with Peltier down and Peltier being a guy that I think they were looking at as, let's say, a, a top nine type contributor, I think that the only real guy you could put in there if you want to promote from within, is Coronado. Yeah, like if Matthew Phillips was on the team, you might shoehorn him in there. But uh, and, and if this was last year's team and last year's GM who liked to go the veteran route, I could even see calling Phil Kessel. Yeah, and uh, you know, if Calgary uh, was not as committed to young guys, uh, I could see a guy like a Phil Kessel getting thrown in there or um, another waiver claim type situation as well. 
Yeah, the only issue with waiver claim, you got to keep him up here all year, and I don't know the Flames want to do that. Yeah, well, if the guy doesn't cut it, you can just cut him later. Like, when I look at the group of young guys that could go in there, Hanzig's not NHL ready. No, not even Kevin close. Rooney's not going to go in there. I know a lot of people want uh, Connor Zari, but I think he lost pretty much a whole year of AHL development time. I think he needs some more time in the American League. Yeah, I agree. Cole Schwint isn't quite ready. Um, and really, I mean, that's kind of your... Unless you're just going for a fourth-line plugger guy like Klapka or Pospisil or somebody like that, one of your older guys, those are really your options. So I think that you'll probably see Coronado start in the spot that was you know, put aside for Peltier because it's really the only option for the same type of player. Yeah, and Peltier and Coronado are fairly similar overall. Uh, so it makes Yeah, I think they're sense. similar in what they would contribute in the lineup. Like, I think they would be bringing Peltier not as a fourth line, you know, two-way player, but as a, a guy they're expecting offensive numbers from. Yeah, and I think that you would have seen Peltier with Backlund to start this year, and I'm already penciling Coronado into uh, the third line right wing on with their at, with Backlund and uh, having Coleman on that line as well and you know see how it goes yeah see I could see the Flames running a second line if you will of something like Kadri, Coronado and either Mangiapane or Dubé on the left yeah and then I think um, if you had Peltier it would probably end up being um I think it would end up being Backlund, Dubé, Coleman if you had Peltier, and then Peltier would end up on the third line with Rujicka and Dewar just to start with. Um, but without him, I think now, really, at this point, if Coronado comes up, now they're really looking for a fourth line guy. Yeah. And I think they're looking for somebody to play with Dewar and Rujicka. Yep. Yeah. And ha that's why I'm lending towards uh, Klapka making it uh, because he's also fast like Dewar and uh, Ruzitska. So he can, and they're all big. So, you know, make that fourth line a bit of a wrecking ball line. Yeah, I could also see either Ben Jones or Marty Pospisil get tried out there as well. Yeah, with Pospisil's Just, last game, though, I think he kind of took himself out of the running because he had a, quite a bit of a disastrous game last time. Yeah, I, I think this team this team wants to evaluate you on more than one game, and they've probably seen him play here a lot in the American League. But I just think being one of the older guys, he might get that first look. Yep. Um, well, and you talked about Klapka being a big guy, and I've been trying to figure out this year – who might sort of be, and I hate to use the word enforcer, but who might be the Flames' muscle this year? You've talked in the past about some of the great muscle we've had with England. Uh, we know that we've had Lucic for a number of years. But without, you know, Lucic on the team, I think we're losing that. And Yeah, like realistically, in, the only guy that's reliable as a fighter is uh, Nikita Zadorov. And you don't, with how good of a defenseman he is, you don't really want to him out for five minutes on a regular basis. No. And I don't even think in the modern NHL, you need to have a fighter, but I think you need somebody who's willing to throw their weight. Someone who's willing to go out there and, you know, stick up for teammates. Someone who's willing to kind of do that hard, that hard, dirty work. And based on what we've seen in the preseason, now, I don't know if he's going to make the team, but I think Dennis Gilbert has been uh, moving in that direction. Yeah. And Gilbert definitely has played well when he's been up here and, played fairly well before getting hurt in that one game uh it, it, it's one of those where i think that the flames will need at least one guy uh who can fight at some point just to you know be a deterrent from you know stupidity overall like what happened to peltier um but it's one of those fine line situations because you need the guy to actually be able to play too and that's where I'm lending towards Klapka overall, but Gilbert definitely can as well. For fans that don't know, Adam Klapka is six foot eight, two hundred and thirty six pounds, so he's a big boy. And I wouldn't say that that's his current game playing that way, but I think you could get him to play that way. I think well, he's... he has fought quite a number of times, so it, yeah, it, but it's not as you said, like he's not a prototypical 
no. bruiser guy who just happens to be a giant. He's, I'd say that he's more like a Lucic style, where he's still got the offensive side, he's got kind of the two-way side, but he can fight when he needs to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I can also see Walker Dewar in that role for part of the season as well. Yeah. Just he's a, in, in, with any of that, it'll be a very situational thing. Like, I don't think that the Flames are going to have a ton of fighting majors this year. No. Um, I, I think that that's kind of, as a league, is kind of going out. Uh, oh, I, I totally agree. And that's why I said I don't think it needs to be an enforcer, but just that muscle guy. And I think that for guys like uh, Klapka and Dewar, that might be their ticket to the to the Na- National Hockey League. Like, whether you do that or not, you might have to learn how to do that to stick around. Mm-hmm. Because I think that, you know, I mean, we like Dewar, but he's, I would say, a very replaceable piece if he needed to. Um, and he might have to learn to have a little more grit to stick around on this lineup. Yeah. And versatility always helps. Um, you know, and if those guys can add that dimension to their game, that that just helps them out. And there's really nobody else when I look at this team that I could say would probably be in that role. Like, even when I look at the Wranglers uh, roster, I mean, there's really nobody else you could put in that role without going free agent shopping. Yeah, and realistically, you, you know, like the, none of the true enforcers right now are guys that you would want out there for, you know, more than like five, six, seven, eight minutes. Like even last year, how often were we complaining about Lucic's ice time? And, you know, like it's tough to have that guy playing a regular shift and... If he's not, then everybody else has to eat his ice time, and that's kind of putting you at a little bit of a competitive disadvantage as well. So it's tough to manage all of it. Yeah, and I think that the Lucic thing, though, is very much a Daryl Sutter oh, thing I agree. more than Calgary Flames. Like, that was Daryl's guy. That's the kind of player Daryl likes. I think if you had a different coach there, we wouldn't have seen that kind of you know time from Lucic. I agree. And, you know, I I guess when I look at this, when I'm thinking about that, I could totally see Gilbert being carried as the seventh defenseman. And I could see Klapka, we were trying to figure out last week who'd be the 13th forward. I could see bringing both those guys in in your extra roles. I don't think they'll carry 14 forwards. I think you'll see them carry 13 for the majority of the season because you can always make a call up if you need to. Um, But I could see Klapka and Gilbert being brought in just to see you have one forward and one defense in that kind of role. And then you can cycle them in and out as needed. Yeah. Um, anything else before we get to, uh, heritage classic stuff you want to talk about for this week? Uh, not really. Um, the team overall, you can tell that they're learning a new system and that the system actually looks pretty good. It's just that timing isn't quite down. Passes well, aren't preseason. Yeah, passes aren't a hundred percent accurate, but they're at least in the ballpark. You know, it, it's getting there. It's just you know clearly a preseason of, under a new coach. Yeah, and I mean we always see that with a new coach. We see you know different systems, guys adjusting. I have to imagine though that while there's some adjustment to the system that we're definitely seeing. I mean, I think that Edmonton game was a great. When I watched the Flames play that one, sort of to the system thought, I thought, wow. There's a lot to work on here. Thank goodness the offseason or the preseason is not over because I think we're seeing things they need to work on. But I feel like they have a new system, but they already know the coach, and that has to give them some familiarity as well. They know Huska. They know what to expect. They know how they're going to be treated. So that probably makes it easier to transition than here's a new coach and here's his new system. Yeah, because you don't have to learn the guy as well as the system. And he doesn't have to learn the guys either. Yeah. Right. He knows most of the guys in this dressing room, at least, you know, at the NHL level. Um, he worked with some of them all the way back to their time in the American League. So he's very familiar with this team. And I think that's probably an easier way to get buy in as well. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the Heritage Classic then. We know that we have the Heritage Classic coming up, the outdoor game between Calgary and Edmonton. Thank goodness they're doing it in the first part of the season, not February like the last one in Calgary where it was freezing cold. Um, Yeah, so it'll be a matchup between the Calgary Flames and the Edmonton Broken Toilet Seats. (laughs) What weird jerseys. Like, we'll talk about Edmonton's in a sec, but the Calgary Flames put out their jersey, and it's a very generic-looking what if I were to, you know, ask a, a an AI to give me a generic looking retro hockey jersey, then that's exactly what you'd get. It's 
is supposed to honor the Calgary Stampeders hockey team. And uh, when I read that and sent that to people, people said there was a Calgary Stampeders hockey team. Like, I don't know what the insistence is with the NHL and these retro jerseys. If you look at a lot of other leagues, the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, they're all moving to more modern stuff. Like, you know, you got City Connect in other leagues and you've got these modern jerseys. And yet the NHL still seems to have this fascination of retro. Even the last couple of years, we have reverse retro. And to me, it's like, these are not interesting jerseys for the Flames. That's my take on it. They're better than the Ronald McDonald ones from the last outdoor game, but they're just very generic. And I would have liked to see them go in a very different and maybe modern or, you know, sort of like, you know, when the, when the third jersey program came in in, in uh, 97 and we had like the Burger King jersey and the, the big Bruin jersey and the gradiated uh, Vancouver jersey, like they were different. They were trying something new. Let's do that again with, with, the, with the outdoor games because to me, these are just boring jerseys. Yeah. Don't you be slandering the Ron McDonald jerseys. The cheese, uh, the, the Hamburglar is going to get you. <laughs> I'm not too worried about the Hamburglar. <laughs> you know, the one thing I'll give the Flames credit for they've never done is they've never worn a jersey with just like fire coming up the bottom. But this seems like a great opportunity to do that for a one-off. Just wear a jersey with like fire coming up the sleeves, coming up the bottom, coming up the socks. And be like, like just, the Tampa Bay Lightning with their weird, you know, seascape jersey with the lightning yeah. and the rain. Yeah, something like that. But, you know, I don't want to see it every day. Like I... I give the Flames credit for going this long and not falling into sort of the the trope that would be easy to do, but do something like that for a one-off. Or they've never worn yellow. Wear yellow for a one-off. Just, I don't know, the whole thing just... I'm getting sick of retro in the NHL. Yeah. I, Even though I, the Flames I, had their previous jerseys with the black and they had the ties on them. Like, we didn't play back in the day of ties. We The NHL likes to just throw these retro elements in. Yeah, and I think that era, frankly, is starting to come to an end, even though... Because, like, you look at, like, the first reverse retro jersey session, like, a lot of those jerseys were actually quite fascinating and kind of neat, and it was an interesting concept. The second group, though, it was quite boring overall, and, like, there's only, like, three or four that were not bad, and the rest were just like, uh, okay, <laughs> Yeah, and it's next year Fanatics takes over the jersey license, right? Yeah, so you can expect all the quality of the jerseys to drop too. And Well, but even then, I'm hoping Fanatics maybe will move in a different direction. Like, we're starting to see some cool modern pieces. As much as I don't like it on TV, I think that the shiny helmets that Vegas wears is kind of neat. We saw LA wear those in their outdoor game. Like, let's just, let's try something modern. Try something different. Remember when uh, when Reebok took over and we saw vertical stripes for the first time? And it's like, that's cool. Let's just do something different. I bet we could do a gradiated jersey like Edmonton tried now with better printing technology. Just do something different. Don't just go for these generic looking, you know, aged yellow. I hate Edmonton's brown gloves and pants. Like, just do something different. Well, at least the Oilers are used to wearing their brown pants. So, I was I I, I will pick my language carefully here on the podcast because we <laughs> want to keep our our rating for all ages. But somebody said, you know, it's good they're wearing brown because by the time the Flames are done with them, you're not going to notice how how badly they got run over. Um, yeah. <laughs> The Oilers jerseys are just terrible. Like they've got the oil drop on the front. We've only seen the 97, but I assume everybody's number goes in the front or they all wear 97. Well, yeah, it's the, it, it's customized to each uh, number. That's what I thought. And then it's got this weird scroll with Oilers on. It looks oh. like somebody went into word and built the Jersey and clip art. I know. Well, that's why I, like I mentioned the broken toilet seat. That was my best, uh, the best suggestion I heard online and, yeah, the tears fall into the toilet, so there you go, hun. <laughs> and, you know, the Oilers have only had a few looks. You know, they've had really their, let's call it their classic look, which they're wearing now. They had the same look with uh, bronze instead of orange, and they had their Spawn era, their sort of third jersey, you know, the the one that um, Todd McFarlane did. Yeah. And they used that for reverse retro. So, again, it's like, why are we just creating random retro stuff do something completely different for the Oilers. Do something completely oh, different for the Flames. And I guess if you want to go retro, and um, Andrew Jepson commented on our Facebook post when I post the jerseys there for Fireside Chat, and I liked his suggestion. He said, if you want to go retro, go all the way retro. Do like an old VHS filter on the video for the game. 
make it feel like you're watching a game in the 50s or 60s. Yeah, black and white the screen and black and white it or you know they never do this but take the ads off the boards, you know, go with the pork pie hats, go with the they've done that before, go with the uh, letterman jackets for the coaches, but just make the whole thing feel go with the old square creases like if you want to go retro, go retro, commit to it. But yep. I guess I'm just and maybe it's more the flames, but I feel like the flames are wearing the retro jersey everybody wants to see them in right now for their home and away. I personally don't care about the Calgary Stampeders hockey team. Like I don't care. I don't, you know, I like the way the flames took the Wranglers name, which is an old team and sort of brought it back. But I mean, I think if you're going to go with a old team, go with one people, more people might remember like the Cowboys or something and, or bring back that stupid, you know, script font the flames had for a year and, and just, I don't know, just do something different. Like as much as I think we both hated that third Jersey script font, it was something different. Yeah, that was one of the more innovative jerseys, and like I still like the Rondell logo on the the shoulders. It yeah, just... and I I like the whole jersey. I just didn't like that logo. Yeah, like if you'd pop the flaming C on it, or do what I've wanted the Flames do for a while. They've always done black on red. Do red on black for the jersey. Do a a black jersey with a red C, or do black on black. Make it black with a black C. Black jersey or red with a red sea red jersey, just the outline. Like I can think of so many kind of modern takes on the Flames uniform. It just it, it feels very uninspired. It's almost like somebody said, "Oh crap, we got an outdoor game coming up." Um, you know, let's just open up the EA Sports NHL 24 jersey creator, and you know, it, it just looks very generic to me. Well, you know, and then you could have had if they went with the Cowboys, you could have had a immediate sponsor with Alberta Boots and. You know, have the cowboy boot Lamleys. logo. Yeah, exactly. So I I had posted a, a poll on Twitter on behalf of Fireside Chat this week, and it was on all our social media networks. You can find them all on our website at firesidechat.ca, but pretty much any social media platform were there. Um, and I had asked fans, do they like it, dislike it, or are they neutral? So we had uh, nine responses. Five of them said they like it. Four of them said they're neutral. Nobody said they dislike it. I'm in the dislike camp. Matt, what about you? Uh, I actually like it, even though, like, it's better than the, the Ronald McDonald outdoor jersey. I and, know you have a Ronald McDonald jersey. You're the sucker who bought one. But, like, they're terrible uniforms. Yeah, it it's, how do you say it? For a 1950s look, it's not bad. But it, I, I do understand, like, your critique of the whole retro thing and... Like it, I, I'm kind of wanting the Canadian outdoor games to be a part of the Stadium Series instead of Heritage Classics as well to get well, the that's futuristic. It. With the name Heritage, you have to kind of they're probably thinking you have to go something you know you got to go with the old school. Yeah, and that that's the main problem. Like if they just made it Stadium Series, then you could just get away from the retro look, and I think that that part will change. And even future. if not stadium series, if you want to brand them differently, brand them as something completely different. Yeah. You know, come up with the great North outdoor hockey game. I don't know. Like, you know, there's lots of names you could use for it, but, and, and you're right. I mean, stadium series, we've seen some more modern looks to that because it doesn't have that heritage piece in it, but I feel like the NHL likes to go back to the well and they used Her heritage classic and now they keep going back to it. And maybe you're right. Maybe that's what has to be reinvented. Yep. It's not like we don't play outdoor hockey anymore. Like, you know, they kind of pitch it like, oh, we're outdoors. That's an old timey thing. I still play outdoor hockey. There's two rinks in my neighborhood. Like, let's not kind of pretend that playing outside is an old timey thing. Yeah. Well, until global warming gets you and then. <laughs> well, but then we won't have them at all, right? Yep. Or in, or in that case, they can play an outdoor ball hockey game. Yep. And just ditch the skates. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, I guess this whole use of felt and stuff to make it look and feel older, it just feels like they're trying too hard. Yeah. Uh, how would you say they, they did a good job for what they're trying to do. It's the overall concept. That's kind of, that's a good way to say it. Yeah. When I looked at it and I'm like, okay, for what they're trying to do, it turned out well, I get it. That sort of thing. But it just, yeah, the concept was poor to start with. It was a well-executed concept, but it was a poor concept. Yeah. It's like you can build a, a well-built deck that, you know, nobody Slants, actually wants yeah. to walk in. 
nobody yeah. wants to walk on or isn't flat, but it's still well built. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so I don't know. I just, I guess, I, I was excited for Heritage Classic, especially to see some of the stuff in the Stadium Series last couple of years. Like I, I liked LA Stadium Series jerseys and stuff like that. And I guess I'm just feeling some disappointment this yeah. year. And that makes sense. I was, I, I was just kind of expecting more. And I guess the one thing I've been very vocal on the show about not being a fan of Blasty, and I'm kind of hoping that. Blasty stays with the with the HL team at this point, considering he's their mascot. But I'm glad it's not Blasty. Yeah, I, that too. Yeah, you know, I mean, if you want to do something quote unquote retro, I would say take the current uniform template and either make it yellow, which they've never had, or take the current uniform template and make it um, black. Yeah, right. Like use use what works. But I don't know. I'm just I'm not a fan. I'm glad we're not the Oilers though. Like like you said it's it's well executed for the concept. The Oilers it's like what is this? Uh, that that actually might be the single worst jersey in NHL history. Like I I, I cannot think of an example of a worse jersey than that one. Yeah, I I'd have to go back. There's been a lot of weird jerseys over time, yeah. but I agree, I agree with you. And and these aren't just being used for the outdoor game. These are going to be used for all regular season Battle of Alberta's this year. So, we're going to see that monstrosity I think 3 times the dome this year. Yay. But it's <laughs> I I'm still trying to figure out too. Like I guess if you buy an unbranded Oilers jersey, you'll just get the drop with nothing in it. Yeah, and that's where like the teardrop goes right in the toilet. Yeah, and <laughs> so if anybody's interested in seeing these, you haven't seen them, check out our social media, check out the Flame site, or go to one of my favorite sites, NHLUniforms.com, and you can see these jerseys and any jersey. You can go through jerseys by team, by year. Um, there's all sorts of of really cool jerseys to browse through. Matt, I think I don't well, know. Honestly, if, like if they had made that the shoulder logo. Like, it would have been a stupid shoulder logo, but at least it would have made some sense. For the Oilers? Yeah. It's way too big to be a shoulder logo. No, I know, but, you know, if you shrunk it down, you know, and... But even then, you can't have the drop and the little scroll thing on your shoulder. You'd have to do something like put the scroll under the arm number or some weird crap like that. Yeah. The whole it reminds thing. me of the it reminds me of the year that Vancouver changed their jersey. Remember, it just used to be the whale with the sea, and then the year they hosted the Olympics, they changed it to say Vancouver on it because yeah. they wanted to be able to sell them as like Olympic souvenirs, I think. And you and I joked on the show, it's like, why doesn't he say Vancouver? So when you get hit, you can look down and go, Oh, that's where I play. Yeah. It's almost like baseball where it, you know, says your city on the front. It's just Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm glad that's not us, but yeah, those one those jerseys are just terrible. Yeah. I feel sorry for anyone that's aware of them. I also feel if there's like an auction or anything, I hope somebody buys one and just burns it. Like, yeah, don't put those up in your sports bar. Don't put those up in your man cave. Buy one of the reverse retros or something. If I was a player it, it, there, it's I would one of the first times that you've seen McDavid genuinely appropriately somber. <laughs> He did not look well, mind you, Kadri didn't look happy to be on the flames either, but you're right. McDavid just looked at it, it's like, what is this monstrosity that's on me? Yeah, it's like really I I'm still surprised that you just have this. a body double and then Photoshop a smiling face onto it. Yeah, like Otiani with the Angels. <laughs> I got hurt. I'm gone. Bye. I don't care pictures days like next week. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The it just it feels like both jersey concepts were rushed or poorly executed, or it's like you know, our, I, whoever has the, you know, whoever's doing the current jersey design doesn't care knowing the license is up next year. Yeah. But I know you've probably bought one because you're the big jersey collector. Yep, I did already. First okay, day. and and what do you think of the quality of it? it? It is actually one of the nicest Flames jerseys that we've had. Where is the felt on it for those that don't uh, know? The logo itself. The uh, logo's felt? Yeah. Is the name and numbers felt? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm not okay. sure about the name bar. I didn't actually run my hand over that, but it looked like it. All right. After the show, you're going to have to go give your New Jersey a gentle caress and let us know. Ooh, Uber no. <laughs> Is that the name you got on it? Yep. You've gotten some weird names. Like you bought what? The reverse retro with Brathwaite or something on it? Yep. So I'm surprised you didn't go with a retro name on this one. Well, it, I wanted it sooner than later, and they're not doing the... Uh, 
the al- uh, alumni game. That's yeah. another thing that sucks. Like that's always been one of my favorite parts of of the outdoor game was the alumni game, and especially with the Oilers. Like as much as we were not Oilers fans, I would love to see some of their alumni on the ice again. Gretzky, Messier, even newer guys like Ryan Smith. Um, you know, maybe old man Mike Smith. Who knows? But like they've Jason Arnett, Doug White. Like I, I, I I'm really gonna miss that. Yeah, I know. And I can understand, like, especially as, like, the world's getting back to normal with COVID and all that, that they're still trying to keep things small for the time being. It's it still, you know, it, it, that was, like, one of the nicest parts of the outdoor game was the day before going to the alumni game. And What all the analysts are saying is, I guess it's, they don't want to do it because they want to keep the ice in good condition. I'm thinking, like, you're in Edmonton, you're in Canada in the winter. You shouldn't have a hard time. It's not like we're doing the game in Florida. You shouldn't have a hard time keeping the ice in good condition, especially if you did it like the night before. I could see doing it the same day, but they're not playing AHL games there. They're not playing WHL games there. They did last time. So why not just put the game the night before? Yeah. I'd love to see Conroy strap in. I was really expecting, Matt, if they did an alumni game, that you'd see Kipper and Nett. Like I, I thought that'd be a great way to sort of kick off his retirement tour. Yeah, they they need to get the European Pro Scout to actually get him on the plane, you know, and <laughs> tie you know, him and to I the mean, chair. You know, you'd probably see Connie there. You'd see Iggy there. Like, you yeah. know, you'd probably see Jelena there. All these guys are still working with the team. Like, I think you could have got a lot of that 04 group back together, and I was looking forward to that. Oh, I know. It but, sucks, but, you know, and if the Flames had had that opportunity, I probably would have gotten outdoor jersey with one of the alumni on it, but you know, because of that, it's like, well, <laughs> hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully Huberto will be the guy that you want when you look back on. Hopefully he'll be the star of the game or something like that. Like, you know, the star of the game last time was Jay Bowmeister. He was, he was kind of the star of the last one. And yeah. I don't think anybody got a Bowmeister Jersey. Well, I think, uh, Renee Bork also had two goals in that, uh, he did. one here. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I guess we'll see how that goes. And apparently, according to the NHL official media site, there are still tickets available for that outdoor game. So if you want to go to Edmonton um, to be part of that in November, feel free to go online and look for tickets. There's apparently still some seats available. Yep. Um, I don't know what they cost, but uh, we'll let you guys figure that out. And I won't judge anyone for going up to Edmonton for that. Yeah, only for that. You must leave if, immediately. You, you, I'll, I'll give them the weekend. Maybe they, you know, if you're up there, you might want to go to the mall or, you know, spend the next day drinking to numb your pain, but don't stay any longer than you have to. Yeah. Any other time you go to Edmonton, Matt and I are going to be judging you. Yes. Silently judging you. Maybe Anywhere we should put an else, ep- you know. Maybe we'll put out an episode later this year of just an hour of silence and we'll call it silent judging. And while they're in Edmonton, they can listen to that. Yep. Um, well, let's let's look ahead at the rest yeah, of the and exhibition. Yeah, just a YouTube video attached with it, with us both just looking at the camera, shaking there you our go. head. Bobbleheads. Yeah. No. All right. Bad. Maybe that'll be our Christmas special <laughs> this year. Um, Matt, let's look ahead to the rest of the exhibition season, shall we? Definitely. The Flames have three more exhibition games before the start of the regular season on uh, October 11th. So they will play one more game at the Saddle Dome, which is on uh, Monday, the 2nd of October, against the Winnipeg Jets. Then they'll go up north to take on the Edmonton Oilers on the 4th in Edmonton. And then they're going to make a quick trip over to Vancouver on the 6th to take on the Canucks to finish off their exhibition schedule. So one home, two road games. Uh, The first two are 7 p.m. starts. The Friday game is an 8 p.m. start. I think these are good teams right now for the Flames to play. They've... They've played the Oilers, they've played the Canucks, they've played Vancouver already, so we know what to expect there. But I think you're going to start seeing a lot less young players and more older guys playing here where we're starting to see cuts made. And I have a feeling by that Edmonton game, you're going to see a very veteran roster. Yeah, I think the only younger guys that are going to be here, frankly, in the lineup will be guys that are actually vying for an opening day spot. Um, And you've got guys like Soloviev and Klapka still like looking like they're penciled into the actual game lineups for the next one. So we'll see. And 
you know, it's up to those guys, and that's part of the good reason with the not getting a bunch of veteran guys is allowing the young players an actual shot to take spots. And Soloviev has really impressed in the preseason and is really pushing to take that uh, opening day roster spot. And we'll see if he isn't going to make the team out of camp, he'll be pretty much the first call up. And you and I are recording this on uh, October 1st, and today the Wranglers camp officially opens at Windsport. So I, I am expecting probably right after that uh, Winnipeg game, there's going to be a whole bunch of cuts made, and if not before that game, because they have a 10 a.m. practice on October 2nd scheduled, actually two different groups down there. So I'm I'm really expecting you're going to see this roster start to get trimmed down, like you said, maybe a handful of forwards and a handful of defensemen staying you know in the nhl just to see who's going to get those last few spots yeah just the cream of the crop and let everybody else go yeah and uh and i even think and i know it's gonna probably anger some fans but i think you'll probably see dustin wolf sent back sooner rather than later as well i agree he looked good in his game against winnipeg a little shaky at times in the first one but you know as we've seen with guys you know, the first game's always usually rough. Like, Kiprasov had a seven-goal game against one time. Uh, Riddick did, too. Uh, you know, and Wolf with the five-goal against. Like, those things happen in the first game of a preseason. And I think we have enough data now from the preseason on what Dustin Wolf is for them to make a decision. I don't know you get more data playing him in one of these. And I think you've got to make sure that your other two goalies are ready. So I'm kind of expecting this week we'll see two Vladar starts and one Markstrom start. What do you think? Uh, I think reverse that, actually. Uh, reverse cause, that? Yeah, because Markstrom's only, I think, played one game thus far. So I think uh, he'll get two more. Just, uh, like, probably the next one and the last one with Fladar getting the middle game. Yeah, it makes sense. Because there's, what, one, two, three, four, four days um, before the actual season starts. So even if you play him in the last one, he's still got time to rest. Yeah. And, uh, Matt, do you want to make any predictions for this week? Uh... Well, frankly, A, I don't think it matters, but I think they'll go two and one this week. It uh, doesn't matter, but just like the Flames, we can practice our prediction strategies. Yeah, so I can practice losing early. And yeah, uh, I'll go it's two my favorite, and one. Favorite part of the show, because every year you lose this part. Yeah, I'll go uh, win, loss, win. Win, loss, win. So you think they're going to lose to the Oilers? Yep, sure. Why not? All right. I That's like, even though it's preseason. We can't draw both Battle of Alberta's in the preseason. So I think that they will probably win at home, win the Oilers, and I think they're going to lose to the Canucks. Yep. So I'll go win-win-loss. Like, I don't know. I, I don't want to start off poorly there. Um, and I, I really think that the game on the second on Monday is a good preseason matchup because that's the same opponent we see a week later to start the regular season. So I think you'll be able to see a lot of what those two teams have and how they match up on the second with both very veteran lines. Yeah. And I could even see the flames throwing the last of the rookies and the young guys in that game against Winnipeg, just to, you know, not reveal the whole game plan. So to speak. Oh, I agree. And that's why I think they might start Vladar there too, just that you're giving them a different look. Yeah. Uh, I, we'll I don't see. know what it takes. I mean, both training camps are in Calgary. I don't know if you have to officially make a call up, but could they have, you know, some of those young guys go practice tomorrow morning at Winsport, come up for the game and then send them back? Or do you have to, you know, paper call them up and send them down? I don't know how that would work at this point. Yeah, I think like once you assign them for the training camp, I think unless there's injuries, you have to leave them down there. OK, well, we'll see what happens then. What if somebody just pulls a Ray Emery and says they get lost going to the arena and they end up at the other one? It's like, well, I'm here. I might as well practice with this group. Yeah, I, I think the NHL is a little less lenient on shenanigans now. So. Every time I mentioned when Ray Emery said he got lost, people are like, wow, that's such an obscure old reference. Yeah. So if, if, no one's, if no one's sure what I'm talking about, or if you're not sure, go out and look that one up. That'll be my homework I'll leave for you this week yeah. for our listeners. <laughs> All right, Matt. Well, next week we'll be back. Uh, we'll start to look ahead to the season and the start of the season, who's on the roster, hopefully. And we're going to do what we do every year before we start the season. We're going to play our uh, season prediction game. And I have about a dozen things I want you and I to talk about, make some predictions, and in April we'll see how right or wrong we are. 
And if it's a season like last year, it'll be in, like, how badly did we screw this one up? <laughs> last year, I thought one of the most impactful players would be Kevin Rooney. So we'll see what kind of dumb prediction I make this year. Yeah, that one, you know, went ablaze, like, almost immediately. <laughs> I'm still not proud of it, all right? Yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah, I, I got to do my homework this week so I don't make that mistake again. Yep. And as always... Go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.